So I've got an assignment today and I, I, let, let me get right to it and, and see what the Holy Spirit is going to do here and you all just continue to bless and minister and, and I'll just go on in the name of Jesus, amen? <laughs> amen. You know, the Holy Ghost can walk and chew gum at the same time, amen? Amen, amen. Well, it's a men's conference and uh, it's an honor to speak to you men particularly because I really believe that the key to what God wants to do in the earth resides in you. So I want to share uh, one of my favorite passages of scripture. It's found in Ezekiel chapter 36. It's just two verses of that passage. It says, thus says the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. I will increase their men like a flock, like a flock offered as holy sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem on its feast days, shall, shall the ruined cities be filled with flocks of men. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I wanna to talk to you for a few minutes from this thought. It's going to take men. It's going to take men. When God made man, he put a mantle or an anointing of authority on him. It was an anointing to rule. Man was to be God's under ruler in the earth. Genesis 1:26 says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And then Genesis 2, 7 says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, a living nephesh, a living being. Now God was not breathing oxygen into that man's body. He was breathing himself, his authority, his power, his majesty. He was putting into man the anointing to serve God as his under ruler. And Genesis 2.15 says, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to tend and keep it, which means to work it, to care for it, and to guard it, to preserve it, to defend it. And after that, of course, we see Adam doing God's business, walking and talking with God in the cool of the day and, and naming the animals and, and tending the garden. And everything was going great. And then two things happened. First of all, something went very, very right. And we find that in Genesis 2, 21 through 24, it says, and the Lord God caused us deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in his place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Now that's all the Bible records as to what Adam's response was. But I can't help as a man to think that when Adam laid eyes on Eve, he was thinking, well, this garden's gonna get a whole lot more fun <laughs> than it's ever been before because he had something standing in front of him that was made especially for him and he knew it. I've been married for 52 years. Praise God that he made a woman. And you know, I've heard people say, particularly when the feminist movement first started, well, you know, men have to get in touch with their feminine side. And I would always say, I am, she's called my wife. So that was something that went very right, but then something went very wrong. 
And you find that in Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, I'm not going to get into this right now, but this to me is the first example of religion because that's not what God said. He didn't say anything about touching it. He said, don't eat it. But you see, religion always wants to add to what God has said and improve on what God has said and, and, and add burdens to what God has said so that we can feel morally and spiritually superior. You know, if you're really a child of God, then your dress won't be more than two inches from the ground. And if you're really a child of God and you're a man, then, you know, you, you've got to be uh, uh, a certain kind of man and you've got to walk and talk a certain kind of way. You know, you, you, can't, you can't be too forthcoming as a man. It wants to redefine who you are in order to match religion. I was telling Jeremy earlier, I was a member of the domination, and when I finally got hold of the word of God through his grandfather and through people like Andrew getting, began to get hold of the word of God, I found out all this religious stuff was robbing me of what God intended me to be. But that's just a footnote. Let's not stop there. It says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of it fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Now, I want to remind you, brethren, I'm sure you already know this. Nowhere in the Bible does God directly tell Eve not to eat of that fruit. God told that to Adam. In Genesis 2.15, it says that, that God told Adam of the tree of the garden, you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. So in other words, he gave Adam this instruction before he even created Eve. So God gave Adam the instruction and that's why the Bible puts the onus for the fall completely on Adam. Romans 5, 17 says, by one man's offense, death reigned through the one. The 18th verse says, through one man's offense, judgment came to all men resulting in condemnation. Verse 19 says, by one man's disobedience. Doesn't say anything about Eve. Many were made sinners. Adam was that one man. Now I want to look at this from a slightly different perspective and kind of change directions on you because there are really two sins which taken together completely change the trajectory of what God had in mind for mankind that got us into the mess we're in. Please pay close attention to this because I'm probably going where you don't expect me to go. The first sin that got us into trouble was Lucifer's pride and betrayal and rebellion in heaven. Universe was a perfect place, but his pride, his arrogance, his thinking he was better than God, smarter than God, stronger than God, deserve to sit on the throne rather than God. That was the first domino to fall. And by the way, all sin is simply an expression of that original sin of betrayal. Substituting our will for God's. Going against God's purpose, God's plan, God's intention setting ourselves up to be our own gods, to do our own thing. 
That's what all sin ultimately traces back to the sin of that betrayal of our creator. Now the second sin was of course where human beings get connected to this. That's Adam's sin in the garden. But his original sin was not eating the fruit. Adam's original sin was abdicating the mantle of authority that God had put on him and surrendering that to the serpent and to Eve. See, God put him in charge. God gave him the dominion. God gave him the authority. And he sat back and let that serpent seduce his wife and then went along with it, cooperated with it. Genesis 3, 6 says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. She also gave to her husband with her. Adam didn't even pick it. He picked it and handed it to him. Now, my brothers, it's time for us to stop eating fruit that somebody else picked for us. It's time for us to realize that the devil will try to get others to pick the fruit that he wants you to eat and hand it to you. And it's time for us to say, if God didn't pick the fruit for me, I'm not eating it. Now, I tell you, as a black man in America, there were those who will say to me, you ought to pick the fruit of bitterness. You ought to pick the fruit of anger. You ought to pick the fruit of hatred. You ought to pick the fruit of racial division. But God didn't give me that fruit. God gave me different fruit. God gave me as his child. He said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. He didn't say to me, well, by your love for one black man to another or your love for one white man to another or your love for one Hispanic to another. He said, by your love for one another as my disciples shall all know that you belong to me. That's the fruit I'm gonna eat. And see, the thing is, Adam wasn't even tricked into it. The Bible says in Timothy 2.14, Adam was not deceived. That means Adam didn't look at the fruit and think it was good for food. He didn't look at it and think it was pleasant to the eyes. He didn't look at it and say, oh, it's desirable to make me wise. He didn't have any of those ideas. Those were all on Eve. Now, I'm not denigrating women in the least. Because I really believe that here, in her conjunction with Satan, Eve represents all the cultural and worldly forces that would try to seduce us to disobey God and obey them. Eve was, was deceived and fell into sin. She got tricked. Adam was not. He walked into it with his eyes wide open. He knew that what she was thinking was not true. And he went along anyway. Instead of standing up and intervening and saying, no, no, we're not, this is not happening. This is my garden. God gave it to me. You don't belong here, Satan. And Eve, you're not going along with him. Slapping that fruit out of her hand and, 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 and picking himself up and say, wait a minute, I'm in charge here. God put me in charge, not you. Instead of taking that authority upon himself, he just backed up. He became a passive recipient of somebody else's will, purpose, and plan for him. So let me say this, my brothers and sisters. My brother's here. So used to speaking to mixed audiences, but let me say this. As far as I'm concerned, America is my garden. God gave me this place. God put us here. And it's up to us as men to stand up and say, Satan, you're not coming in here and seducing us with a bunch of nonsense because we're not eating that fruit. Yeah. 
We're not eating the fruit of Marxism. We're not eating the fruit of socialism. We're not eating the fruit of atheism. We're not eating the fruit of racial division. We're going to eat the fruit that God picked for us from his word. And God's word says heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. Everything that comes against God's word is a lie. You all saw the famous smack. Here's a man who got mad because another guy, he shouldn't have made the joke against, against Jada Pickett, but he made a joke um, against this man's wife and he got mad and went up and, and smacked um, the man and, 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 you know, created a big controversy for himself. And then we, we, we find out that they have an open marriage. Because she was raised that way. He wasn't. But she was. She said, here's the fruit we're going to eat. Which is, I can have sex with whoever I want. I really believe that that man was boiling on the inside over that. Because no man, saved or not saved, can be comfortable, unless there's something really deeply wrong with him on the inside, can be comfortable with his wife sleeping with other men, but yet he had accepted that because his wife said, here's the fruit I want you to eat. And I think it erupted and he just used that as an opportunity to get his aggression out. But I've said about all these Hollywood stars, all these people who we give so much attention to, what they need is Jesus. What they need is to be saved. What they need is to come to God. You see, in a sense, there are really two original sins. The first is trying to take on a mantle of authority that you don't have. That's what Satan did. He tried to take God's authority from him. I mean, I've always said, you know, I, why would anybody be afraid of somebody stupid enough to think you could defeat God? I mean, because you've really got to be dumb to think you can defeat God. But that's what he was trying to do. And then he gets into the garden, and here's where the second sin comes in. Abdicating the authority that God did give you. See, Eve took upon herself the authority to do what she wanted to do, and Adam abdicated the authority that God gave him to rule that garden the way he said it should be ruled. We can't abdicate our authority as men. I know we got these concepts now, toxic masculinity and, and all of that. I, they can, listen, they can say what they want to say, but a man should be a man and let a woman be a woman because there's only two genders, that's all, and there's nothing else. So we need to ask this question. How in the world did Adam become so passive? How did he become, I mean, he's walking and talking with God. How did he become this wimp who sat by and let this happen? Now look, I believe with all my heart that the reason Adam did that is he didn't want to hurt Eve's feelings. The Bible says he wasn't deceived. That means he knew it was wrong, but she was going ahead with it and he didn't want to hurt her feelings. He didn't want to offend her. He didn't want to get into conflict with her. He was trying to be sensitive. But let me tell you something, brothers. There's no such thing as courage without conflict. 
There is no such thing as courage without conflict. If you're going to be a courageous man of God, just make up your mind. Andrew just said it. You are going to have conflict because the world is not at peace with you. And when you stand up as a man of God, you are going to face conflict. Look, the goal of the coward is to avoid conflict at all costs and to say nothing even though you know that something is wrong. Because that way, I can avoid anybody being offended. I can avoid anybody not liking me. I can avoid anybody not wanting to be around me because they think I'm a little too dogmatic or I, I, I'm a little too forthright in my faith. But Jesus said, if the world hates you, remember that the world hated me first. Say, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But you are not of the world, therefore the world hates you. He said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him for all that is in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away with the lust thereof. But those who do the will of God abide forever. If Adam had stepped in between Eve and the devil, he had a conflict with the devil. Well, so be it. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And of course the devil's going to get angry when you stand up. Those demons are going to rear their ugly heads and you're going to see them uh, fuss and, 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 and get mad and, and want to persecute you. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The devil can't defeat us. He's already a defeated foe. He abdicated, Adam abdicated to avoid conflict. And he abdicated on the most important question. Are you gonna do God's will? Or are you gonna do somebody else's? And look, I wish I could tell you that the pressure would never come from your family, come from your family. The pressure would never come from your, your children, never come from your wife. But sometimes the devil will move in in the most intimate circumstances and try to stop you from doing God's will. My wife and I left Massachusetts in 1998. The Lord spoke to me in 1991 and told me, I'm taking you from Massachusetts, but he didn't tell me where. And I told my wife, I said, the Lord spoke to me and told me we're leaving Massachusetts, but he didn't tell me where we're going. We didn't have any idea. I was praying on that literally for seven years. Lord, where do you want to send us? Lord, you told me we're leaving. Well, where, Lord? I, I just wasn't going to be like Abraham, just pack my, my family up, hit the road. I had to know where we're going. And God didn't tell me. And finally, in 1998, God, actually 1997, God spoke to me and told me where we were going. He told me he was moving us to Virginia, which is my ancestral home. My grandfather was born in Virginia. My great grandparents were slaves and sharecroppers in Virginia. And God was calling me back to my ancestral home. And when I told my wife, after six years of praying for this, I told my wife, I said, God spoke to me and told me he's gonna send us to Virginia. And my wife said, why do we have to be in such a hurry? I knew what God had said, but I tell you what, it got dicey. It got dicey. Because he had told me, but he hadn't told her. And I used to say to him, Lord, it'd be nice if God told her. <laughs> so she would get it. And we finally moved. And I'll tell you what, she went with me because she loved me and I was her husband, not because she liked it. But I knew that if we didn't do it, I would be disobeying God. And you know what now? My wife loves it. Now she says, I am so glad we made that move. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't fuss with her about it. I didn't abuse her about it. But I was just steadfast in knowing what God had said and that we had to do it. And yes, it created some conflict. But if you're going to follow God, you've just got to face the fact that from time to time, there will be conflict. But God will resolve that. He'll strengthen you in that. He'll get you through it. 
I told one of my relatives when my father died, um, and one of my relatives who happens to be a Muslim, uh, after my father passed, he died as a, a born again, spirit filled, tongue talking believer. And, and my relatives said, well, you know, we're all going to the same place anyway. I said, well, you're not. <laughs> what do you mean? I said, well, he accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So have I, you have not, you're following something else. So you're not going to the same place we're going. I said, because there's only one way to heaven and that's through Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness, whoo. Oh, man, I was persona non grata in about half my family for about two years. I don't care. Because you need to be saved. And Islam can't save you. Buddhism can't save you. Hinduism can't save you. There's only one name given unto heaven among men whereby we must be saved. That is the name of Jesus Christ. And if I don't tell you who will, Look, you know what? My wife thanks me for being a man because I don't care what anybody says. Women want a man. One of, the, one of the most frequent complaints I get in my counseling as a pastor is couples coming to me and the wife saying, he won't lead. He won't take responsibility as the head of the household because women know that what God intended for some man, for, is for a man to be a man. We don't abuse our families. We don't mistreat them. We are kind, we're decent, we're honorable. But God made men the head of the household and men are supposed to step up and take that mantle of responsibility and take it seriously. And when you don't, it leaves a vacuum for the Satan to move in which is exactly, is exactly what happened in the garden. And the biggest social problem we have today, I'm convinced, is not racism, it's not poverty, it's not all these other things that people want to name. It's the absence of men from the home. All this inner city violence you're seeing, the young men who are acting like terrorists, killing people willy-nilly, my organization has something called the Gallery of Forgotten Children. 318 children murdered, innocent children murdered on their streets, in, on their bikes, in their bedrooms, in their living rooms, in their backyards, by thugs roaming the streets who don't care who they kill when they decide to have a shootout or they decide to commit violence, they consider it collateral damage. And since the defund the police and dismantle the police movement began, we've had 318 innocent children murdered in the streets of our cities and they're being murdered by young men who never had a father in their lives to tell them, boy, here's how a man behaves. And you won't find many men, you won't find many politicians who will say, you want to be a man? Stop impregnating a woman before you marry her. Stop having sex before marriage. Start, start getting married and raising your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Why don't you get a job instead of looking to hustle and looking to be a street person and deal drugs and hurt people? You want to be a man? Be a man of your word. Be a man of integrity. Be a man of honor. Stop using the excuse of racism and take responsibility for your own life and your own actions. You know, a brother I know said when he was living for the devil, he said his house was a mess. He said they had a little dog and the dog would just mess up everything. He said, just do everything everywhere. He said, man, I got saved, even the dog changed. And some of you may know Jason Taylor. Jason Taylor's a cowboy I preach with. Jason Taylor said, I was a rancher before I got saved. He said, and I, he said, boy, my cows would sometimes give me a fit. He said, I got saved. I found even the cows acted better. <laughs> Brothers, when men get saved, things fall into place. I mean, think about this. A man walks into his home angry, bitter, frustrated, 
and that atmosphere will take over the entire household. A man walks into his home at peace, filled with the love of God, anointed, the Spirit of God moving in his life, full of the Word, full of love for his family, and that atmosphere takes over the whole household. Man, we can't abdicate our responsibility. So our text says, thus says the Lord, I will let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this. I will increase their men like a flock. So shall the ruined cities be filled with flocks of men. When the world sees men loving the Lord, loving one another the way God intended, when the world sees men hugging one another across racial and cultural lines and, and not allowing the superficial nonsense of the complexion of somebody's skin to divide us. The world steps up and takes notice. That's what God is saying. He said, then they shall know that I am the Lord. Man, we gotta show the world that we're men of God and we don't think the way the world thinks. We don't act the way the world acts. We don't speak the way the world speaks. We have a different vocabulary informed by the word of God. That's why Ezekiel 22, 30 says, God says, I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me in behalf of the land so that I should not destroy it. But God said, but I found no one. Now we know that's a messianic text, but I really believe it speaks to God's desire to see men step up. Make up a wall, a wall of what? A wall of, of truth, a wall of morality, a wall of true spirituality, a wall which says, look, this is right and that is wrong. No more of this moral relativism where everything is everything. Good is evil, evil is good. It doesn't really matter. Call it what you want. No, but men who are willing to stand up and say, no, 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 there is truth. And the truth is what makes people free. Micah 4, 6 says, he will turn the hearts of fathers to the children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Notice this. The hearts of fathers are turned to their children first. And when that happens, the hearts of children are turned to their fathers. For those of you who don't know me, don't know much about me, Andrew alluded to it. I was born into a broken home, raised in foster care for the first 10 years of my life. And I, by the age, age of 10, I was a member of a gang. I was angry, I was bitter, because my attitude was, if my mother and father aren't here to teach me, to instruct me, nobody's gonna tell me anything. My foster parents couldn't control me. They would try to discipline me, I would run. I'd run away to a friend's house and lie and say, oh, my, my foster parents said I could, I could spend the night here. And they would spend all night looking for me, trying to figure out where I was. And then one day my father pulled up on a street corner where I was hanging out and summoned me and said, come here. I went to the car, hey dad, because I knew who my father was. I didn't know my mother very well because she was caught up with Jehovah's Witnesses. But my, my father said, you keep saying you want to come live with me. You want to live with me? I said, yeah, dad, I want to live with you. Because I would say that every time I saw, why can't I live with you? Why can't I live with you? He said, well, get in. I got in. He took me down to my foster home, walked in, told my foster mother, Miss Beck, he called her. I called her mom. I didn't call my real mother mother because I didn't know her very well. He said, Miss Beck, I'm taking my son to live with me. And of course, she took two steps back. I, it's, I can remember it like it was yesterday. Like, she didn't quite understand what he was saying. Because remember, she, I, I didn't say this, but she got me when I was 14 months old. I was her baby. And she said, well, what do you mean, take, take him where? He said, I'm taking him to live with me. And she started weeping and crying and said, you can't do that. The courts won't let you. The social service system won't let you. And he said, Miss Beck, if I don't take my son, we're going to lose him to the streets. And with her crying and moaning about packing my stuff, and he said, no, get in the car. And that was it, literally, literally, in about the course of 30 minutes, my life changed because my father took me to live with him, sat me down and said, son, you've been saying you want to live with me. Now you live with me. And every day with me can be like a day of heaven on earth or every day I will tear your behind all to pieces. <laughs> I got the message. 
I went from being an F student in fifth grade because I rarely went to school. I hooked school most of the time to being an A student in sixth grade. And that's how I ended up going to Harvard Law School. I tell people the grace of God and a daddy who told me early on, you will make of your life what you want it to be. Don't come back to me with excuses. You will find obstacles in life. You go over them, you go under them, you go around them, you go through with them, but don't come back to me with excuses because I don't accept them. I've got a sixth grade education. I expect you to get a college education. I earn my living with my hands. I want you to earn your living with your brain because you got a good one. Now get out there and do it and I don't want to hear anything else. Wow. No more gangs, no more petty crimes, no more hanging out. My father said, when I come home from work, you have two hours. I expect you to be inside doing your homework. When you're done doing your homework, you can play the playground across the street. But when I walk up on the porch and I call you, be within earshot. I don't want to have to look for you. It got real disciplined real quick because a man stepped up and took the mantle of authority that God put on him and changed the trajectory of my life. And I'm telling you, had it not been for that, I'd probably be dead by now or in jail because many of my friends were. So men, I just want to say, it's going to take men to get the job done of rebuilding this country after what God intended it to be. And men do it knowing this, that we've already defeated our enemy. He's already done. Jesus has already whooped him. All we've got to do, and I'm going to talk about that this afternoon, this evening, all we've got to do is take our rightful place under the mantle of authority that he's given us and let God get it done. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Knowing this that no weapon formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment will be condemned. This is your heritage as a child of God. You will not be defeated because God is with you. Just make sure you know who you are and don't abdicate the authority that God has given you because the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. For the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Men, the Lord is the strength of your life. Who do you have to be afraid of? When the wicked, even the, your enemies and your foes came to eat up your flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against you, your heart shouldn't fear. The war may rise against you and this be confident. One thing we have desired of the Lord, that will we seek after, that we may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our lives to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he will hide us in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle. Shall he hide us? He shall set us up upon a rock and now our head will be lifted up above our enemies round about us. Therefore, will we offer this tabernacle sacrifices of joy. We will sing, yes, we will sing praises unto the Lord. I need to quit, but I feel like preaching up in here because the man we serve is the son of the living God. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father and the prince of peace and nobody can defeat him for the Lord is his name and the Lord is a man of war and he causes us to always triumph through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's awesome, brother. Love you.